Um, so Ambassador Sullivan um, took up his post as a European Union ambassador to the United States um, just a year ago. And um, he's been a longtime EU official, um, and he's previously served as chief operating officer of the newly created European External um, Action Service. Um, he is, has also been the Commission Director General for Trade for the European Union, the Secretary General, and the Director General for Education and Training. He began his diplomatic career in the Irish Foreign Ministry and spent four years in the um, EU Commission's delegation to, to Japan. He's a graduate of Trinity College, Dublin, and the College of Europe in Bruges, and he holds honorary doctorates from the Dublin Institute of Technology and Trinity College, Dublin. And he was awarded the EU Transatlantic Business Award by the American Chamber of Commerce in 2014. Um, I would also particularly like to thank the number of sponsors we have for this event, the Center for European Studies, the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, the Center for International Business Education and Research Cyber, uh, the World Affairs Council of Austin, the LBJ School of Public Affairs, the Institute uh, for His Historical Studies in the Department of History, and particularly the Consulate General of Ireland here in Austin, um, and, and particularly um, Adrian Farrell, who, who holds that role. So thank you very much. Um, and now it's great to hear Ambassador O'Sullivan speak. Thank you. Well, Dean Stark, uh, Doug, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. A great pleasure to be here. Um, I was in Houston yesterday, and it was basically tropical rain, so I, I thanked the good people of Houston for making me feel at home coming from, from Ireland via Belgium. But I told them next time they didn't need to bother. Uh, and uh, so I'm delighted to find that I got some real Texan weather in, in Austin, uh, even if I understand this is as good as it gets. Uh, um, and I'd also like to thank uh, um, Adrian Farrell, uh, the Consul General of Ireland, for helping set this program up. It's fantastic. Uh, for me, as the European Union ambassador in Washington, we don't have any presence outside D.C., and the, my f ambassador colleagues uh, in, in Washington have graciously agreed that we can rely on the Consul's General Network around of many member states. Uh, uh, Sujira Sim, the Consul General of France, uh, based in Houston, was looking after me yesterday, so Adrian takes care of me today. So it's, it's a great service I get we, from, our, from our member states, so we're very appreciative. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't... Um, talk to you today without mentioning the events in Paris. Uh, I know that, certainly speaking for all of us in, in Europe, we were transfixed and traumatized by what we witnessed uh, on the television and in the news uh, on, Friday, on Friday evening, uh, the, the horrific events, uh, the, the barbarism of what was done, the, the, the sheer nihilism of what was done, uh, uh, the, 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 the wanton desire to just create havoc and terror and maximize the, the damage and, and the suffering. Uh, and this is, you know, a horrific moment uh, for, for France uh, and, for, and for Europe. Uh, and uh, I want to acknowledge here, and I know that um, Sir Jirasim would, would join with me in saying how grateful the people of France are, but the people of all of Europe are, for the enormous outpouring of sympathy uh, and uh, support that we have felt across all of the United States, seeing the flags at half-mast uh, all this week when I arrived here in uh, Texas, the same. Uh, the governor made a great gesture to the consul general today with a, a letter and uh, the flag which was flown at half mass. So thank you very much for that solidarity and it's always a reminder of you know who your friends are when, when the going gets tough and we're very appreciative of that. And clearly, as the French government are doing uh, very dramatically and, and, and very effectively, uh, the first response has to be a security response. You have to try and find the culprits. You have to see if there are other culprits. You have to try and destroy the networks. You have to try and make the territory secure. So this is, of course, the first reaction, uh, and France is doing that very well. And by the way, if any of you are thinking of going to Europe or to Paris, I encourage you not to change your plans. I think, uh, paradoxically, it may even turn out to be one of the safest places you could travel to, uh, uh, and certainly 192 heads of state and government uh, will be traveling to Paris in the next few weeks for the conference uh, on climate uh, change. So I think uh, it's very important not to allow the terrorists to disrupt uh, our travel plans. And that makes me, there are two points I'd like to make just about this whole uh, incident. Uh, the first flows from what I've just said. Uh, the purpose of terrorism is to terrorize. And the purpose of terrorism is to provoke repression as a counter-reaction. Because that then f 
reinforces the cycle of alienation of certain sections of our population, of certain uh, religious or ethnic groups, and that becomes a recruitment tool for the terrorists. This is the classic uh, uh, tool of terrorism going back to Bakunin in, in, in Russia through all the terrorist uh, movements we've known, and being Irish, I know something about it. Uh, the IRA uh, uh, used that tool, and we must not let the terrorists win. We must push back, of course, uh, to protect our citizens with whatever means is needed in terms of security, law enforcement, but we must also not allow the terrorists to undermine our values, our commitment to human rights, the rule of law, liberty. This is what is best about our societies, and if we allow the terrorists to undermine that way of life, then they have won, even if we maybe feel slightly safer when we walk down the road, which I'm not sure we necessarily would. So I think it's very important to bear that in mind as we, as we go th look at how we in Europe are going to respond to what has happened in, in, in Paris. We have had experience of terrorism. We've had the IRA uh, in my lifetime. I remember vividly the IRA campaign in Ireland, but also in, in the UK. Uh, we've had the, the Red Brigades. I remember when I worked for Romano Prodi, the President of the European Commission, twice Prime Minister of Italy, he lived in Bologna, I used to go there often with him. In the railway station there was a plaque commemorating the 50 people who were blown up in that railway station by the, by the Red Brigades uh, in the early 70s. We had the Bader Meinhof uh, in Germany. We had the Basque separatists, ETA, uh, committing atrocities both in France and in, and in, and in Spain. And now we have, uh, uh, we had uh, the 190 people killed in the metro system in, in Madrid in 2004. We had nearly 30 or 40 people killed in London in 2005 in the subway. So, you know, we're not unfamiliar, unfortunately, with these kind of situations. We know how to deal with them. Uh, they are painful, they are tragic. But you pick up the pieces and, and you move on and you continue to take your society in the direction which you know you have to go because as the heads of state and government uh, said in the statement they issued of solidarity with France, good in the end is stronger than evil and we have to believe that. The second point I'd like to make is that we absolutely must push back against any attempt to conflate the terrorist attacks in Paris uh, on Friday with the issue of refugees and asylum seekers. There is absolutely no evidence that the people fleeing from uh, uh, situations of conflict, particularly in Syria but in other parts of the world, that these are any, anything other than people precisely fleeing from the same terrorists who attacked us in Paris last Friday. Uh, and it would be a complete mistake to try to uh, imply that there is a link between these two things. That is not to say, and I honestly don't know, whether it may turn out, it may turn out that perhaps one of the people uh, found at the scene had come through uh, as, as an asylum seeker, that, that may happen. But the fact is the majority, the vast, vast majority of these people uh, are fleeing to build better lives for themselves and their families, and it would be a victory for the terrorists if we allowed what has happened suddenly to lead us to the conclusion that we have to shut our doors. Of course, the refugee crisis in Europe is different than what you will face here in the United States when you address these issues, because these people are already on our territory. This is not a crisis of migration for Europe. It is a crisis of refugees and asylum seekers who have international rights and obligations when they knock on our door and say, I want to come in because I'm fleeing from persecution. We don't actually have the right to send them away, even if we wanted to, not that I think we should want to. They're entitled to be brought in, to be sheltered, to be housed, to be fed, to have their families uh, looked after with health care, while we process their application for asylum under the international laws which govern uh, that status. Uh, and this is one of the reasons we've had a crisis in Europe in, in the last few months, has simply been that the volume of people coming in has reached a point where our infrastructure can't cope. The countries of transit are struggling to cope. Italy and Greece have faced a huge challenge uh, on the southern uh, Mediterranean. You take an island like Lesbos, which I know well, which has in winter maybe a population of 75,000 people. This summer alone they had 350,000 refugees. You think how they're going to deal with that situation and how they can actually look after those people properly when they're struggling with their own economic situation, Greece, so well. It is true that many people have died crossing the, the Mediterranean, 3,000, but we've rescued 122,000, rescued on the high seas and saved from drowning. The people of Greece, the people of Italy have shown remarkable compassion 
and humanity in opening their homes, their schools, their town halls, their churches, to try to house people, to try to provide them with food and clothing. And the same compassion has been shown when the, when the mood shifted across to the Western Balkans and people started to come through uh, Serbia and Croatia and Slovenia, uh, uh, Germany, uh, Austria, Sweden, all the countries of Europe have shown enormous compassion and humanity. But the fact is, the numbers have made it difficult to cope. We've got maybe as many as 10,000 people coming every day uh, in, in countries who are frankly used to dealing with a couple of hundred asylum seekers per year. So there's a logistical problem. There's, a, there's an administrative problem of processing the files and actually dealing uh, in, in due process of, of processing the applications. And of course, inevitably, yes, there is a public uh, social reaction because when these numbers of people come and the people have to find accommodation, then it cr can create some tensions with the rest of the population who find that, for example, social housing that they'd expected to move into next year has now been allocated to refugees and maybe they'll have to wait another two or three years. Uh, there's a human reaction here that you cannot walk away from or a political reaction of the sustainability of these kind of numbers. Now, we're going to have to deal with this crisis. Uh, and it has caused a lot of tension within Europe, but I believe that we will deal with this crisis because I think the important thing to learn about the European Union is its enormous resilience. The European Union has in many ways been forged through crisis. It was desi designed, as you know, after the Second World War to basically build reconciliation between France and Germany and to try to build structures in Europe which would make it impossible for us ever to go to war together again. Successive enlargements have brought in other, other players. The United Kingdom came in in 1973, along with Ireland and Denmark. I don't want to diminish the importance of Ireland and Denmark joining the European Union. Uh, but uh, the bringing in of the UK was a historic, uh, a historic achievement because when Winston Churchill made his famous speech in 1948 in favour of the United States of Europe, it was also very clear that it was the United States of Europe without the United Kingdom. So to have brought the UK into the process in 1973 uh, was, a, was, a, was a major political step. Subsequent enlargements brought in countries uh, seeking stability after emerging from totalitarianism. Greece in 1981 after the colonels. Spain and Portugal in 1985 after Salazar and Franco. These countries saw the European Union as a place where you could develop a new way of uh, being after coming out of totalitarianism. And of course, the historic enlargement of 2004 when we brought in 10 former countries of the Soviet bloc. I don't believe that the European Union can claim credit for the fall of the Berlin Wall. I do believe that the European Union can claim credit for the fact that the fall of the Berlin Wall was not followed by chaos and violence uh, and, and, and instability. That instead, we enabled all those countries to make a smooth transition to liberal democracy built based on the rule of law, uh, human rights and respect for the individual and the market economy. If you look at the situation of Poland, for example, compared to that of Ukraine, and I'm leaving aside for a moment Ukraine's latest problems with Russia, but if you just look at the, the, the development over the years, Poland uh, was poorer than Ukraine when it entered the European Union in, in 2004. It is now uh, has a, a GDP four times that of Ukraine, which shows that joining the European Union is a recipe for success, not only in terms of stability of democracy and, and human rights, but also in terms of, of economic progress. And in all of these enlargements, We've built the single market. The European Union of 28 member states is the largest economy in the world. Um, so when America and China argue over which is the biggest economy, you're fighting over second and third place. But, <laughs> but you're still two very important other economies, I grant you. Uh, we built the euro, uh, a common currency amongst 19 countries. And I know that we've had a difficult time since the financial crisis of 2008, but I consider the euro is a success. It has brought prosperity, it has brought stability. And when we look at why did we build a single currency, we built a single currency because in the mid-70s, when we had the two oil shocks, European currencies went off like fireworks in every direction with competitive devaluations. And frankly, devaluation is a great tool provided nobody else use it. If you're in a closed space like Europe, where 95% of our economic activity is with ourselves, starting to de de depreciate your currency just leads your neighbor to depreciate their currency and their neighbor to depreciate theirs, and suddenly everyone's currency is depreciated, no one's had any gain, and everyone's had a loss. That's why we create a single currency, and that's why the single currency is a huge achievement for our economic uh, prosperity. We had a difficult crisis after 2008. We had a, America had a better crisis than we had because you wear a fully integrated federal model, we had not fully completed the architecture of economic and monetary union, and we had to work on that, and that slowed our reaction. I, I don't deny that. We had to fix some, some 
repairs to the architecture. We've done that both in terms of banking union, uh, which because banking resolution and, and dissolution was a key, key element in this crisis, but also in terms of management of public finances, greater European coordination of uh, individual national budgets. And I believe we now have the elements in place which, will, which, would, never, which would enable us much to face a similar crisis much, with much greater strength than we, we did in 2008. And this is in part how Europe learns. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we make mistakes, we build it, you know, we are, you, you've had this debate in the United States, uh, you even fought a civil war over it, uh, the, the balance between the federal and the national, or the state in your case. We want to build an integrated Europe, but we also want to retain the maximum competences and level at, at, the, at the level of member states. We do not want a fully integrated United States of Europe, that's not what our people want. But of course then you, you always have to guess well, when you're building something European, like a common currency, like a single market, uh, like a Schengen, a free travel area, passport free travel area, how do you get the balance between what's decided at the centre and what's decided at the, at the periphery and what's decided nationally? And if you take the refugee and asylum policy, it's clear we have a common policy. It's a European policy. We have European rules, but it's implemented at the national level. And then you discover when you actually, the system comes under strain, you suddenly realize some countries can't cope with the responsibility which they themselves wish to retain. Are they able to help us police our external frontiers? I respectfully suggest that Greece at the present time with the, the way the situation is evolving is not able actually to police its external frontier and it needs European help. Italy was not able to manage on its own a search and rescue operation in the, in the Mediterranean, not because they, they weren't willing to try, but because it was, it was uh, too much for one country to be able to manage. Uh, and the, equally, the question of processing refugees and asylum seekers when they enter our territory, we're going to discover that we're going to have to do more of this at a European level. We're going to have to have more coordinated European management of these situations. And this is the history of the building of, of, of the European Union. Now, in all of this, transatlantic relations, of course, are hugely important. Uh, America has always been a strong supporter of, of European integration, going back to the, the, Marshall, the Marshall Fund. Uh, and transatlantic relations are very important to all our member states. I'm based in Washington and I have 28 fellow ambassadors from, from all of my, my member states. Uh, and they're all very busy promoting their national relations with the United States. And they all believe, or many of them believe, that they have a very special relationship with the United States. And I'm sure this is true because for many people in America, when they look at Europe, they firstly think of countries also because of your own ethnic background in some cases, even if the de demography of, demography of the United States is changing rapidly. But for, for many people here, they still feel German-American, Italian-American, Irish-American, uh, French-American. And I understand that, that people firstly look at the, the countries. But it, the United States has increasingly recognized that to be a partner in the 21st century, f for Europe to be a United States partner, actually you need us to speak with one voice. We've seen this in the case of Russia, Ukraine, how important it was that Europe remained united and adopted tough sanctions against Russia. By the way, sanctions which cost us economically far more than they cost you. We trade more with Russia, 15 times more with Russia uh, than, than, than you do. Uh, the same is true of the sanctions with Iran. It was European sanctions that brought Iran to the table for a new nuclear deal uh, in 2012 because once we, we, did, we took some tough decisions on sanctions. For example, uh, the French company Peugeot was a, a major exporter, was the leading car exporter from Europe into, into Iran, that those sales stopped the minute we, 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 we put the sanctions. There's a factory uh, in, in France that had to close down because of those sanctions. Italy, uh, Greece, was a major importer of cheap Iranian oil. Uh, it was one of the major sources for the Greek economy. They accepted to source their oil from elsewhere and pay higher prices as part of the sanctions. E this at the same time as uh, Greece was going through the consequences of the economic crisis. So it was Europe's determination to join shoulder to shoulder with the United States in forming a coalition to force Iran back to the table, but it was only Europe acting together. If America had had tr to try and persuade itself, each, tr each of the 28 member states, to adopt those sanctions, I think we'd still be discussing it. The fact is the European institutions, the Commission, the decision-making process in Europe, the role of the President of the European Council, Herman von Rompuy, now Donald Tusk, demonstrated that institutional Europe can actually deliver a more reliable partner to the United States than simply dealing with 28 individual countries one at a time. And I think this is uh, very much the lesson of the 21st century for us in Europe. I briefly sketched out the history of European integration. 
The, the challenge of peace and reconciliation, the challenge of economic competitiveness, the challenge of reconciling uh, the ancient uh, enmities of the, of the continent, uh, these are the challenges of the 20th, 20th century. The challenge of the 21st century is Europe in the world. How does Europe uh, project uh, the values and, and defend the values that we, 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 we hold dear? How do we influence world events? A former president of the Commission, Jose Manuel Barroso, used to say, uh, scale will count in the 21st century. When we are together, we're the largest economy in the world, we're 500 million consumers, we're 28 votes in the United Nations, two, two permanent seats at the Security Council. We can actually impact world events, we can affect them. Uh, even the largest of our member states would struggle to have that impact acting alone. And for the United States, uh, of course, we, we share enormous values with the United States and, and this is the fundament of our, of our, of our alliance. But equally for the United States, we're a much more useful partner when we are an integrated European Union speaking with one voice than when we are 28 countries going off in, in different directions. And I think this is a lesson which has been learned uh, well in, in, in Washington and is respected. In this regard also, of course, we're looking at uh, the trade negotiation between us. I talked a bit about that earlier at the, the Chamber of Commerce. I'm not going to uh, go into that here again, but if you want to ask questions, I'm happy to deal with it. But if we could conclude... Uh, uh, an ambitious and forward-looking trade agreement between the two uh, most important trading blocs in the world, the United States and, 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 and Europe. This would be a huge economic benefit in the short term. It would enable us, I think, because we could, if we had regulatory cooperation on standards needed for industrial uh, and, and in, indeed, even more importantly, future digital and other products, we could set the standards for the 21st century globally uh, in a way that will not be possible if we have separate U.S. and uh, EU standards in, in, emerging, in emerging product and, and uh, standards issues. But also, geopolitically, it would cement even more closely the strong alliance we have uh, in terms of the values uh, which, which, which we share and which, are, which will be challenged in the 21st century. Uh, it will be challenged by Mr. Putin's uh, vision of managed democracy, by the Xi Jinping's vision of a one-party uh, state. Uh, there are people who are going to say Western liberal democracy doesn't deliver successful outcomes. It's not capable, it's not the best way forward, either economically or socially, uh, and we have to uh, push back on that and explain that the model we have developed over many hundreds of years uh, of, of tough experience, both in Europe and here, tested uh, against time, that this is a model which delivers the best outcome for our people, both in terms of e economic prosperity, in terms of individual liberty, uh, and safety and security, and that this is the best way to secure uh, our future. And this will be one of the debates of the 21st century, and I think uh, it's in the cooperation between the U.S. and the EU in this area is going to be one of the great challenges we, 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 we will face. We can see it now in Paris. We can see what's happening uh, in, in Syria. We can see what's happening uh, in Iraq. We can see what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, these are all hotspots which are going to challenge us uh, in the coming period and probably places that we haven't even heard of uh, as we talk today because next week or next month there will be some new crisis. Uh, uh, but the problem will always be the same, how to have more international cooperation in favor of outcomes based on the values we, 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 we cherish rather than uh, the, the, the might of a military force, uh, the, the ability to terrorize or, or the uh, uh, clientelism and corruption of oligarchic or mon uh, mon monopolistic political structures. I will stop there because I'm conscious that I, I, I've said, when, when, when you announced that I said I could stay till 3.15, I saw everyone on that side of the table going, what, what's he done now? Um, so it may have to be you know, 10 past 3 rather than 3.15, but I'm happy to uh, answer questions. I look forward to having a dialogue with you on this issue, the issue I've raised, but anything else you want to talk about. Thank you very much indeed. question. <laughs> well, you know that most people in Europe were opposed to, to the invasion of Iraq, and it was a difficult moment uh, in our relationship. Um, particularly difficult, I think, for talking to a number of French diplomats who were serving in the French embassy in Washington at that time. Uh, there, was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of disagreement. I respectfully submit that those who were opposed to that invasion at the time were right and have been proven right. Um, and, but we are where we are. Uh, we, can't, we can't go back. We can't undo it. 
uh, and I think we have to go forward. There's not a lot of point in having a lengthy debate now. Uh, we are where we are, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, we have to now deal with the situation as we find it. How serious a challenge, in your view, is the political opposition to TTIP? Well, I, I think um, TTIP, for those of you who aren't familiar with our acronyms, is the trade agreement I was talking about, the, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. We have a great knack for choosing very easily understood uh, terms to uh, convey our, our, our political objectives. Um, uh, there has been, an, an, uh, frankly, I mean, I don't think probably many people in this room don't know what TTIP is. I certainly think if you walked down on the streets of Austin and you stopped people uh, on the street and said, what do you think about TTIP, they would not have any idea what you're talking about. Unfortunately, unfortunately, if you did the same in Europe, I think there's a chance that quite a lot of people would know what you were talking about. Um, because this has become a sort of lightning conductor for uh, a certain amount of uh, opposition to globalization, to increased trade liberalization. Uh, I think it needs to be taken seriously because I think it's, it's, it's not a majority movement, it's a minority movement. I mean, the popularity ratings for TTIP, the support for TTIP on average across the European Union is running at about 58, 60 percent. Um, it's a bit lower in Germany and, and in Austria, closer to 50-50, but in, in, in other countries it's running at 60-70%. So the European average is 58 or 59. So I think that's, you know, that's fairly solid support. Uh, but I think we have to take seriously the fact that there are a number of people who uh, criticize this agreement. Um, to be very frank, I think there are a number who criticize it genuinely because they fear it may mean a diminution of uh, consumer health standards, food safety standards, uh, that it may mean uh, that corporations can challenge uh, the ability of governments to regulate on issues of public policy like plain packaging for tobacco products or, or uh, public health services. Uh, so I think some of it is, is people genuinely worried that it could have these outcomes. I think we have answers to that. I think we can demonstrate that that is not what we are trying to do publicly. We can show the mandate under which we operate from the European Union. It's publicly available on the website. We're publishing all of the documents that we're submitting in the trade negotiations. We publish them on the web. Uh, if you're bothered to read them, because I think one of the things that frustrates people is they don't understand how mind-numbingly boring most trade negotiations are. Uh, so they're convinced we must be hiding something. Unfortunately, we're not. It is it, What you see is what you get, pretty much, in a trade negotiation. I mean... A parenthesis, a typical trade deal runs to about a thousand pages. If you read our trade deals, which you can with Korea, with Canada, we've just done an incredibly ambitious trade deal with Canada, 90% of that is, is the same in, in every agreement. I mean, you don't reinvent the wheel in every trade agreement. So you can actually, if you want to know what TTIP looks like, you can just go and look at most of our trade agreements, and it's not going to look a lot different from those, just as it's not going to look a lot different from your TPP uh, or your trade agreement with Korea. Uh, so uh, on one level, you can say to people, what are you worried about? Of course, they're worried about the 90, the 10 percent, which will be a bit extra, will be a bit different, and they're saying, oh, in there, you're going to do all kinds of nasty things. Well, the only answer to that is when you finally produce the text, you show it to them, and you say, we haven't done any of these nasty things. But I think there are some people who are opposed to this, whether we do nasty things or not. Uh, and some of that is opposition to globalization and a, a sense of losing control, you know, the sort of sense that somehow things are happening over people's heads, that they don't feel they're in control of the situation. Some of it, frankly, is engineered by people who just don't want the EU and the US to get closer together. So there's a, there's a, there's a sort of mix of different elements in the opposition to TTIP. I think much of it can be answered rationally and, and in, in honest uh, democratic debate. Uh, some of it, we're never going to persuade people because they just don't want this to happen because for the very reasons that we think geopolitically this would be the right thing to do, they have a different geopolitical vision of the world's future and they, they don't think it's the right thing to do. And those people will never be, will never be convinced. Thanks for coming, Ambassador. Um, as part of the migration crisis, there has been talk about Schengen being suspended as just a natural result of this. And I was curious if you thought that there were any of the other EU institutions, bodies, agreements uh, around specifically collegiality and 
promoting the union that you thought could be threatened as a result of migration and not necessarily the threat of terror, but just specifically the mass number of people coming from outside of the EU? Look, I, I, I don't is the answer. Uh, you know, it is perfectly normal in exceptional situations that you take exceptional measures. Uh, if you had a crisis in Austin, it might not be unusual for the police to seal off uh, the city, to have roadblocks uh, out of the city if you're looking for someone. You know, this is what's foreseen in Schengen. If the situation uh, becomes more complicated than normal, you can exceptionally introduce uh, controls. For example, uh, the French undoubtedly had it in, in their minds to have very strong security measures around COPS 21. They probably would have had additional security at airports, additional checks on passports at people coming across borders. This is part of the normal life of Schengen. We've had this on many, many occasions. I can tell you countries have felt the need to reintroduce border checks because they feel there's a situation where they feel threatened and the security advice is, yeah, put back some border checks temporarily. These are temporary measures. The refugee crisis has given rise to similar situations because, frankly, there's a kind of knock-on consequence. If one country uh, 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 becomes, makes it more difficult for migrants to come in, they then come in through another country who then feels that they have to take action. So we've had this kind of domino effect. In every case, people have said, we're doing this on a temporary basis. I absolutely believe we, we need, I mean, I think it was clear from what I said that this crisis, like other crises, like the Euro crisis, like uh, uh, crises we've had in the past, has shown some of, the, some of the flaws in the Schengen system. So now we have to kind of repair those. And I think everyone is committed, firstly, to putting, for example, one of the issues that was not much talked about in, in terms of Schengen was the control of the external frontiers. This was left very much to individual countries to do without too much sort of European oversight. It's clear to me that one of the consequences of this crisis is there's going to have to be more EU oversight of how countries control the external frontiers. We can't just leave it to their discretion because on that depends the security of all of the rest of us. And that may mean, and as indeed it's been suggested, the creation of a European border guard service who can come and assist and help member states who feel uh, unable at a given moment perhaps to cope with particular pressure on, on their external border. So I think you're going to see adjustments to the way the system works. You're going to see uh, people uh, cooperating very closely to make sure that we can fix any of the sort of weaknesses which have been revealed in the Schengen system by this crisis. But I don't think anyone for one moment, well, Sorry, there probably are a couple of people, but I don't believe that anyone who really cares about the future of Europe thinks that putting back permanent border checks will actually make us more secure. I would remind that during the, the worst of the IRA terrorism between Britain and Ireland, we always had the free flow of people without passport controls, and at no stage did anyone in the British security family ever suggest that reinstating passport checks would somehow make you feel more secure. Because there are too many ways for people to get round borders, and, and if you look, if you know Europe at all, our borders, our internal borders are almost impossible to police. Yes, you can put checks on the main auto routes, but, but there's about 20 side roads beside where you can walk across. There are people who own properties that actually stretch across the borders all over Europe. We, the reason we dismantled border checks was because we knew it was not the most efficient way to actually ensure your security. It's all about uh, intelligence sharing, police cooperation, information sharing. That's how, you, that's how you really address the terrorism, and everyone who deals professionally with security knows that. So I think we have this temporary situation. I don't know how long it will last because, you know, these situations are, are complicated, but I don't believe that anyone believes that uh, dismantling Schengen would be anything other than a massively retrograde step. You know, I have what may seem like a slightly perverse uh, attitude to this. I actually think it's healthy. Uh, I, I would rather see people forced to put forward the policy. If, if they don't like European integration, and, and people, some people don't like European integration, I'd rather see a party say, I'm against European integration, vote for me. And then let's see. 
Let's see how they get elected. Let's see when they get elected, how they would propose to govern, how they would explain what their model of economic and social and political progress would represent. And I think the more you do that, the more ultimately they will be exposed. Of course, in the short term, it's a shock to the system because we had, I don't know, you know, uh, uh, a substantial minority of Eurosceptic parties elected to the European Parliament uh, last year. And many people were in shock and horror. I said, great, let's bring it on. Let's have the discussion. Let's have the, we, we live in a democracy. We are not trying to fool people into European integration. We're not trying to trick them into European integration. Those of us who believe that this is the best way forward have a very strong argument to make and we have to make it, but we have to win that argument democratically. And if other people temporarily do well, we have to think, well, why is this happening? And why are people believing them and not us? And so I think at the end of the day, this, is a, this just shows you how far European integration has come because, you know, 20 years ago you would have had difficulty to have a heated debate about European integration because most people didn't think it was relevant to their lives. Now you have the euro, you have the single market, you have Schengen, you have terrorism, you have refugee crisis. And suddenly people understand that actually this European thing deals with very real issues of concern to your daily life. So they start to have an opinion about it. And I think that's healthy. So I, the answer, how do you deal with it? The answer is you debate it, you make your case, and you explain why it's the, wrong, it's the wrong answer, why nationalism or extreme nationalism is not the answer to Europe's problems. We built the European Union precisely because we know where the nationalism of the 20th century brought us, not because we don't want to be proud of our countries or our heritage. We haven't homogenized Europe. If you travel to Denmark, it's still Denmark, believe me. If you travel to, when you go to Paris, it's still Paris, it's still France. It's, uh, you go to Spain, you go to Latvia, they're all sovereign, you know, independent, vibrant cultures, different, different languages. But my goodness, how much better we are working together than sealing our borders and pretending that our country is the best in the world and I don't need to deal with anybody else. And we know where that led us. So I, I think the best answer is, is debate, is, is take on the issues. We will have this in the United Kingdom. Again, maybe it's slightly perverse, but I actually think let's have the referendum, for goodness sake. If for 20 years, it seems to me, they've been arguing in the UK about whether they like the European Union, they want to be in, they want, let's have the debate. And then let's see. Uh, and if the democratic will of the British people is to leave the European Union, which I would deeply regret for them and for us, well, I think we have to respect that. But I actually believe that when you have the debate, I think the result will come out the other way. And I think that will more often than not be the case uh, elsewhere in Europe. Thank you. Hello, Ambassador. My question is, how successful would you say US and EU sanctions have been against Russia? And should further steps be taken to stop their involvement in Ukraine? Well, I think the sanctions have had an effect, to be honest. Um, I, I don't think the purpose was necessarily to change policy. I don't think we were naive enough to expect that Mr. Putin was going to say, oh, you've adopted sanctions. So sorry, my bad. Uh, I'm leaving. Uh, I, I don't think that's what anyone thought was going to happen. But he had to understand it came at a cost that what he had done, the annexation of Crimea, the aggression in, in eastern Ukraine, the stirring up of the separatist sentiments, uh, the you know, sending in of troops disguised as uh, you know, volunteers, uh, apparently they were on holiday. Hey, honey, let's take the tank on, on the holiday. You know, we'll, I mean, uh, but he had to be shown that this was unacceptable. And I think the sanctions have hit Russia, they have hit the economy, and I think Mr. Putin has been very surprised, frankly, at the extent to which we have maintained European unity, because I'm certain he thought he could divide the European Union, I'm sure he thought he could divide the EU and the US, which he has not done. Now, the solution is Minsk. The Minsk uh, agreement sets out very clearly the steps needed to be taken to restore the territorial integrity of, of Ukraine, putting undoubtedly the Crimean discussion in a slightly separate package, but so far as Eastern, Eastern Ukraine is concerned, uh, finding some understanding between the Eastern provinces and the Kiev government about a degree of regional autonomy to reflect the fact that there are a substantial number of Russian speakers in that part of, in that part of Ukraine, uh, and uh, a guarantee of Russia and of the other countries to respect the, the territorial integrity. If Minsk is implemented, and it's a big if, if Minsk is, is implemented, then I think uh, we can consider a normalization of relations with, with, with Russia, provided they have fully implemented Minsk. If it is not the case, then I think until Minsk is implemented, we will maintain the sanctions, and you will see the European sanctions rolled over uh, in January for a further period to, uh, because we need more time on Minsk. And if uh, Minsk breaks down or there is an escalation, then in my view, Europe will be willing to take additional sanctions against Russia if we get into that situation. I don't know, like anyone, 
how the situation in Syria, the, the, the sort of the role of Russia now in Syria is going to play in. At first sight, it seems that Russia is being slightly more conciliatory in the Minsk process than they were a few months ago. But I you know, view that with great prudence and caution. Let's wait and see. Uh, but I think we have to be very firm with Russia that the full implementation of Minsk is the only way in which we will uh, lessen the sanctions. Well, uh, the deal with, we have to understand, the deal with Iran was about one thing. It was about uh, putting in place a system which guaranteed that Iran could not acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, last summer, around the time the deal was finalized and when we were debating it extensively here in, 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 in the United States, uh, the, esti the, e the experts estimated that Iran needed about three more months before they could produce weapons-grade plutonium. Um, so the choice was really quite simple. I mean, either you reached a deal which uh, stopped that process, and this deal which we have involves Iran giving up all its enriched uran uranium up to 20%, which is what you need for uh, nuclear weapons. That will be given up. They will limit their enrichment to 3.6%, which is way below what you need to produce uh, weapons-grade uh, material. They will be subject to the most incredibly intrusive surveillance system that any country has ever accepted from outside its own territory. There will be uh, experts from the International Atomic en Energy Agency. There will be CCTV cameras put in all the main uh, uh, centers of research. Uh, everything, you know, if. Ukraine tries to move a millimeter or a milligram of uh, plutonium or uranium uh, outside the parameters of this deal, we will know. Uh, and they have accepted, which is something I don't think people in America fully understood. The international community, and in particular China and Russia, have accepted that the snapback provision means that they've effectively given up their veto in the Security Council because the internationally agreed UN sanctions will be lifted by unanimous agreement of the Security Council, but can be put back at the request of one member, namely US, France, or, 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 or UK, without, without the possibility of anyone else on the Security Council to object. So they are immediately reinstated if any one member of the Security Council says, I want them back. I mean, I don't think people here fully understood what that means. China and Russia have effectively given up their right of veto on the reimposition of sanctions against Iran if Iran doesn't respect the deal. This was a remarkable diplomatic achievement to negotiate this deal, by the way, and I was astounded that people in America didn't actually stand up and applaud President Obama and Secretary of State Kerry for what they, what they achieved in terms of, by the way, with help from the rest of us, I would add. Um, but uh, that's the deal we have. Now, so I think in terms of acquiring nuclear weapons, I'm absolutely confident that there is no way Iran can achieve nuclear weapons uh, you know, in the next 10 to 15 years, and frankly, even for longer, when you look at the constraints which are built into this deal, it's not going to be easy. That does not mean that we've fallen in love with Iran. It does not mean that we suddenly think Iran's a great place and they've got a nice regime. No, of course not. We have many, many disagreements with Iran over the financing of terrorism, over their attitude to Israel, uh, over their you know, uh, general human rights policy. So we're going to continue to disagree with Iran about all the rest. We only wanted one thing out of Iran, because however much you worry about Iran saying death to Israel or death to America, how much more worrying would it be if they were saying death to Israel and death to America if they had their hands on a nuclear bomb? The purpose was to make sure that they, couldn't, they didn't get their hands on a nuclear bomb, and that's mission accomplished. The rest will be another job, day's work, of trying to somehow build a new relationship with Iran if that's what they want, if they're willing, we will see. But if they don't, then we may have to impose new sanctions on Iran for other reasons, which is perfectly possible if, if that's needed. And our sanctions related to terrorism and human rights, fu funding of terrorism and human rights violations will remain in place, as will yours. I have a follow-up question to the Euro-skepticism problem, uh, because I think it's not only a problem of uh, being pro or against Europe. Uh, True. It's also a reflection of problems the European Union has, 
in terms, for instance, of the balance between economic and social issues or uh, about the democratic process within Europe, just the crisis management it has something that, that has been mentioned by the Council and European Parliament and also national parliaments sometimes have been bypassed. So there is uh, also, I think, some reasonable space for further development of course. pro European course in that direction. Would you please comment on that? No, I agree. I, I don't think the European construction is perfect. No. Um, I think there are reasons, of course, why uh, it's, it's an imperfect construction, um, because, as I say, the general tendency is when member states are approached with a problem and they want to have a European solution, they nonetheless make sure that the European institutions only get the, the minimum transfer of sovereignty needed to kind of manage the, manage the problem today, right? And then inevitably, sooner or later, maybe it's 20 years later, maybe it's five years later, you discover, well, actually, you need a bit more European involvement if this is to work. Uh, and so that's the process we're in. Uh, and I, I, I agree with you that uh, the, 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 the balance between the economic and the social, between um, uh, the, the power of, of uh, national parliaments, uh, the European Parliament, uh, the European law and national law, th these are all you know, moving targets. Uh, we are, the system is constantly evolving. And it will continue to evolve. And I, I don't defend it as perfect. I do defend it as democratically decided. I absolutely reject the notion that Europe is anything other than democratic. Everything has been approved through negotiations and treaties which have been approved by national parliaments, by the European Parliament. I mean, you know, there is an awful lot of democracy in Europe. So I don't think there's a problem of democracy. I think there is a problem, if you want my personal view as a long-standing European official, I think there's a problem of member states not being honest with their citizens about the limits of sovereignty. I think member states still want to pretend that actually a country can be 100% sovereign over everything it does when they can't. I'm not saying they say it in exactly that way, but they, 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 they still like to give the impression that actually the most important stuff still gets decided in, in national capitals. And to be honest, that isn't true anymore. Uh, some very important stuff now gets decided in Brussels, and frankly, some very important stuff gets decided internationally, uh, not in the European capital, not in Brussels, and not in Washington, but, you know, in, 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 in other contexts. And I think we need a more honest discussion with our citizens about the limits of national sovereignty in the 21st century and what it really means. Because I think you cannot criticize the European Union. The tendency of many national politicians is to criticize the European Union uh, for anything that goes wrong. So they say, that's those people in Brussels. Anything that goes right, they say, thank goodness I was in Brussels to negotiate that good outcome because if I hadn't been there, they wouldn't have looked after you. Now, I understand this. It's national politics. You have a certain amount of this in America. I understand. But that doesn't work because you can't do that six days a week and then on the seventh day say to people, by the way, you'd better vote for what's going on in Brussels because people say, wait a minute, haven't you just told me that all that nasty stuff was coming from Brussels and if you hadn't been there, it would have been a disaster. Now you want us to give them more power? So I think that's a debate we have in Europe. And we have to have it more openly and more honestly. And I think in answer to the question about Euroscepticism, I was trying to say, let's have that debate. Let's, let's, let's be honest about what doesn't necessarily work as well as we would like it to in, 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 in Europe. But let's also be honest with people that the answer doesn't necessarily lie in, doing, in having less European integration, but possibly in actually having more European integration in certain areas with the checks and balances of democracy and uh, uh, transparency and, and, and the rule of law and uh, so forth that, that are so important to all our citizens. Going back to uh, the talk in Russia, um, when considering the tremendous effect it's had on their state enterprises, and then we combine that with um, European and EU development of um, kind of a regional more um, energy policy, such as the LNG port in uh, see, Poland, you had one in Lithuania, and now Croatia's talking about one as well. Do you actually see the EU in Europe in general coming out with a greater trade and economic leverage over Russia after the sanctions are ended, given um, increased competition within the Federation, as well as the need for technological know-how, investment, uh, etc. Well, I think the, the, the tragedy of Russia in, in, in the last 10 or 15 years is it's been a huge wasted opportunity to modernize their economy. I mean, we all hoped that Russia 
after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, sorry, the, the order was the other way around, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, uh, that we wanted Russia to succeed. We wanted Russia to be a success. And one of the things we knew that Russia needed to do in order to succeed was to modernize its economy. There is no economy in the world that has built a sound economic future on commodity exports alone. And that's what Russia is trying to do. That's all they basically do. That's all they can do. They can export oil and gas. They can't do anything else. They don't make anything else. They don't produce anything else. And this is a tragedy for a country uh, of the size and importance of Russia. Uh, and we tried everything in the EU to help Russia. We put money into Russia. We put, we put cooperation with them to try and help them modernize their economy. We kept saying to them, you have to open up your economy. That's why we supported their joining of the World Trade Organization, because we thought this would be a really important step. But unfortunately, Russia's accession to the World Trade Organization has probably been one of the less successful experiments in, in, the, in less than China, who basically China, when they joined, they kept their commitments. The Russians have in many cases uh, not implemented or gone back on commitments taken. We've got many dispute settlement cases in, 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 in hand. So it, it's, a, it's a tragedy for the Russian people. And I think that Mr. Putin is, you know, leaving aside the politics of what he's doing, I think one of the criticisms that will be made of him 10 years from now is that he let down his people in terms of their economic future. Russia is going to get poorer and poorer at this rate. And the ones who will benefit are the oligarchs and the, the, the small number clientelists client around the, the, the centers of power who are doing very well, very wealthy. You've got many you know, Russians all over, all over Europe. The ski resorts of Europe are full of wealthy Russians, but they represent a small proportion of the Russian population, many of whom are living in extreme, extremely difficult circumstances and who don't have a fantastic prospect of a better future. And so I, I don't, you know, it's not a question of the sanctions making us better leverage. I say this with sadness. I don't say it with any pleasure. I, I don't want a confrontation with Russia. I don't want Russia to fail. I want Russia to succeed. The Russian people are hugely important. Russia is a hugely important country on our continent. It's our biggest, biggest neighbor. It stretches from Europe right through to Asia. Uh, so we need a successful Russia. But unfortunately, the policies which are being pursued are not going to have that outcome. And I leave aside any value judgments about democracy or human rights for a moment, even if I think these things go hand in hand, of course, because you can't actually have a vibrant market-based economy if you, if you deny human rights and you, you repress uh, civil society and, and you, know, you have the kind of policies uh, about uh, gay rights and so forth. But, I mean, I leave aside any kind of judgment about whether you like the politics of, of Mr. Putin. Just look at the results of what's actually being delivered for his citizens. And uh, these are the wrong outcomes. So I, I think you're right that, tragically, Russia is on a sort of declining trajectory. Uh, but I take no pleasure in that statement. I, I would wish to see it different. And I hope that at some point, if we can get Minsk settled, we can get back to more normal relations. And I hope we can somehow get turn around the, the direction of Russian economic policy in a way that offers uh, the Russian people a, a, a more optimistic future than I feel is ahead of them today. I mean, the, the, the numbers are still relatively small. Uh, I mean, I, I think the average uh, Muslim population across the EU is less than 5%. Uh, uh, and I think in France, uh, Sujir, is it, is it 7%, I think, maybe? Uh, and that's probably, you know, one of the higher places. So, I mean, we, we really should relativize this. There is not a sort of massive uh, uh, influx of, uh, of Muslim people into Europe. On the integration, look, it's worked well and it hasn't worked well. I mean, there, there are clear problems. Uh, uh, if you look in, 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 in the UK, uh, uh, they, there, are clear, there are pockets of non-integrated Muslims. Uh, the same is true in France, in Belgium. 
So I, I, I don't think we can look with great satisfaction at the way this has worked. I think there are alienated uh, communities. There, that is ripe for radicalization, and that's why we have to admit we have had uh, numbers of people who've gone. I can't remember a time when people left their own country to go and fight someone else's war. I think you have to go back to the Spanish Civil War to find a time when people kind of voluntarily said, I'm going to fight someone else's war. And that's what we have. And we have to acknowledge, I mean, that's a reality, and therefore something has gone wrong, that if people are persuaded, and I mean, goodness, it's even women being persuaded to go and get married and produce babies as part of this war effort. I can't even imagine it. Whatever about misguided, testosterone-driven men going out to sort of, you know, thinking war might be exciting. Read your, read your Ernest Hemingway, but uh, I mean, you know, it, it's so there's something not right. I, I, so I think we have to acknowledge that we have not succeeded uh, in integrating the, the Islamic community in, in Europe as well as we, we, we would have needed. I think we have to learn from that. I don't think it poses a sort of existential threat to Europe. I, I think it's, it's all manageable. We will find ways through it. Uh, I think the vast majority of Muslims are horrified by what has happened in, in, in Paris. Uh, you know, the social media is what it is, but I don't think it reflects the views of the vast bulk of, of, of decent Muslim people across all of Europe. But yes, there are, there are pockets of, of, of uh, dissatisfied, alienated uh, uh, communities ripe for radicalization, and there's been a lot of money put into that radicalization, by the way. This hasn't happened just by accident. We know where that money has come from. Uh, and so we, I think one of the things that people are very conscious of now with the, with the refugees, and let's not forget, I talked about the large numbers of refugees. It's true that relative to the kind of numbers of asylum seekers we normally have, the numbers are quite high. They are still, you know, we're talking about one or two million people in a continent of 500 million. So, I mean, you know, once again, this is not a sort of... Uh, 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 an irresistible wave of, of, of numbers of people, but the fact is when those people turn up, you know, in a short space of time in one place, this puts the system under, under huge strain. So in that sense, yes, there is a problem of numbers, but I don't think in the, the bigger picture, the helicopter view, there's a, a, a big problem of numbers for the moment. But one of the things we have to watch is that if, to the extent that a number of these refugees and asylum seekers end up living in Europe, as I think they probably will, many of them, uh, we need to pay close attention to the integration challenge uh, and perhaps to learn some lessons from what hasn't worked in the past and do it a bit differently in, in the future. Um, my people are getting nervous because I have to drive to San Angelo. Well, sorry, I have to be driven to San Angelo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.